him. And um, be quite funny. And uh, I think I left it in to please. His choice as an actor. He's just uh, he's got his uh, his little shirt saying "Hello, Ruben." I mean, he's just he's funny. I'm a little bit like Ed Harris when he works, where Ed will get kind of angry when he shakes and then shoots another take and shoots another take. Ed just gets his process. He gets angry that in, at himself, and he's working himself into his character, and to, to get, it gets better and better and better each take. And John gets a little angry with himself. He's like, I want one more, I want one more, one more, one more. And he kind of almost yells at the cameraman, you, 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 you got film? Got one more, one more. Got it? Mike, let's, let's go, let's go, let's go. Just keep going, keep, keep going. And uh, like, okay, John, re relax, we got to set him up. And so we'll just keep rolling camera, burning, burning film, and... But that's just the way John riffs, and he's very quick on his feet, and, uh, you know, he comes up with great ideas. So, uh, yeah, but that's what we do. I mean, as the directors and actors, you know, you kind of, you, you work the scene, and you start to, when you do a movie like this, where it's supposed to be fun, and it's supposed to be funny, you work the scene. And these are things that you can't come up with when you're writing the script, and it's just, this is how you just... Working with the actors, and this is just what I love doing on the set, is you just start coming with these odd bits that give it, you know, just a funny character. Not like I am. You notice we, we, we shoot we're by the Enola Gay, which was uh, the plane that dropped the first atomic bomb. Uh, you've got the Concorde there. It was a museum that is just, just in its its breadth of planes, is just phenomenal. It took them I think two years to park the planes, and they had to build the museum around the parked planes because they were so they were so big. You had to crane them in, set them up, and then keep continually building the museum, which is still not done to this day. Seventy-one plane. It's a plane uh, that's been around actually since the '60s, believe it or not. A uh, filmmaker had ever shoot one uh, for a movie, which was an Armageddon. We had two. Fastest plane in the world. I think it took an hour to fly it from. Edwards, I think this plane was at Edwards, to, and it landed here at Dulles, which is, this is right near Dulles Airport, in this brand new Smithsonian Museum, which exists in Washington, which is at Dulles Airport. Now, I wanted to shoot in this Air Force Base uh, in Tucson, which is a gigantic, it's, it's not a wrecking yard, but it's a yard where they reclaim every single plane that's ever been in the Air Force, and they use them for parts. There's actually a section of the of the of this gigantic. I mean, I'm talking it's miles of desert, and they line up these planes in a very organized fashion. And actually, the Russians to this day keep it still on satellite every single day because they want to know if we're moving or or parting out any of our B-52 bombers, which are still we have a bunch of bombers there, and uh, if we need spare parts for our B-52 bombers, which are the ones that carry nuclear weapons, it sounds very Cold War era, but. Uh, this is where every single plane in the Air Force, unless it's crashed, goes to this yard. Uh, geography buffs, I didn't pull it off, but uh, most people in Taiwan don't know where <laughs> this museum and this <laughs> Arizona airfield exist. Uh, so this is my way of jumping time, or not jumping time, but jumping locations by showing that, that the desert outside uh, this museum. Good humor of a humping robot. No. People couldn't believe that I was actually going to do it, but uh, you've never seen a humping robot, and um, we were the first to actually ever film something quite like this, uh, but was very in character, and it was uh, every single audience I ever saw it play with was a gigantic laugh. Let the crew whatever. They're not funny. character of Jetfire, just the animation of his face and the whiskers and the, the rusty crusty just of them all, the gruffness of them of his face, just so close to the actors. Yeah, to have an old, I'm not sure, to have an old, uh, an old Transformer. It might have been, I wanted him to be rusty and old, and I think Aaron wanted it to be some old thing, you know? Uh, and uh, I think by us spitballing together, the idea of that w that was fresh is to is, is to just try to make a transformer that was just really rusty and old and not some shiny Porsche or, or, or Corvette. The characterization of him was it took so many voice actors to go through. We had so many voice actors come in and try a spin it. Even John Turturro did a did a spin at him as playing a a, a Southern Baptist preacher. Um, just to do a tenth for Jetfire, and it was something that kind of, 
it started to grow on me. And after we, like, literally, I think we looked at over 150 voice actors for this role. Um, everyone playing it from a very highfalutin English person to, uh, to, to just, uh, you know, very Scottish, very British, very... Um, it, it just, what I like about Mark Ryan is it sounds like he's a guy from the other side of the tracks. He's a working class tone to him, uh, which I liked. In this script, I just I always told the writers we're always going to have a problem with the jet fire scene when he's trying to give the backstory because originally it was 12 pages long, from meeting him to uh, going out to Egypt, and uh, that's a lot of screen time. So uh, we had to keep cutting it down, cutting the story, cutting the exposition because they wrote a very big story. And there was a lot of story. And there's several MacGuffins. And I, I didn't even want to know. I didn't even want to know because it's, it's like, I know it's a couple too many, but uh, they were trying to accomplish a lot so that it'll help set up for a third one. So this rock where you're seeing the jet fire scene, I seen uh, Lawrence of Arabia when I was young, uh, and Stephen put together uh, a special day for me, me and Shia at a theater that he rented out where he had a 70 millimeter restored print of Lawrence of Arabia. This is one of the same place. This is Wadi Ram in Jordan where some of the scenes from uh, Lawrence of Arabia were shot. And uh, the rock that we were actually shooting on when watching the movie in full 70 millimeter, at one point, Shia, Shia turned to me. We raised our hands, we gave each other a high five because this very rock is where they did the shot where they had the, uh, it was the only scene where they had the women in this movie and that was uh, when they were on top of the rock seeing camels and whatnot, a uh, procession walking underneath them. It's kind of thing that we shot in place. It was another, this was maybe the most miserable scene in the whole movie uh, just to figure out because it's not just downloading backstory, but in what flow of information? What do you hear first? How do you get the audience to pay attention to it and hear everything they need to hear in order to understand what's happened and in order to feel the second half of, you know, uh, everything that comes after this scene? So we rewrote it a million times. And again, we're literally handing the actor lines while he was at the microphone. But at some point, what happens is that ILM needs enough lead time to be able to make adjustments and we ran out of time we just ran out of time so half of the scene was stuff that we had already recorded and then there were a couple shots we were able to change but that was it it was a very strange way to write but it was very down to the wire it's a i guess it's just sort of a fact of if you structure your story around a mystery you always pay a price at some point and that you have to pay it off you have to tell the story also admittedly the the MacGuffins are somewhat unwieldy and that we're trying to have our cake and eat it too with some of those sequences like the kitchen bot and then bringing Megatron to life and all those things that you end up splitting the pieces of the cube in a way that drives you right. but I it's think, because you want to see those moments yeah I mean that's the thing I think we love as audiences we love to sit in a theater and wonder what's going on for as long as possible that's the fun of a ride like this and what happens inevitably is that you have to come to a point where the audience goes, you know what, all right, I'm tired of the mystery. I, I need answers now. I, I'm, and, and knowing when to drop that in is very, very uh, tricky. But usually you end up with a scene where someone has to come and tell you everything. In the first Transformers movie, it was the scene where the Autobots land. You know, we had an hour of mystery of what was going on around the world and what was it all about. And when the Autobots land and tell Sam, we always knew that... And that, again, was another scene where that we'd been, you know, we were rewriting until two weeks before release. These scenes that your first draft almost never stays because when you have so much information, it's easy to tune it out. It's just very, very easy to tune it out. And it's important to watch scenes like this with test audiences because it gives you a very clear indication of what they're not hearing. So afterwards you can ask them questions about certain plot points and did you get this and did right. you hear that and they say, you know, yes or no. And then you have to rewrite according to that. It's very, very critical, I think, to the to the process of telling stories that have so much CG animation in them. I think actually in the I think in our in the first movie we toyed with in one of our early drafts, remember archaeologists finding drawings of transformers mm -hmm. on the caves in Egypt, etc. So the idea that you know many of the alternative archaeological studies, you know, a lot of some people think that aliens visited a long time ago, and some of the art and things you see represented in pyramids are similar because of some ancient influence and so that whole theory that was behind the idea of 
linking the pyramids and ancient artifacts.